12 Things That Wowed Us at the Paris Olympics Spent over two weeks covering the Paris Summer Olympics. Here's some of our standout moments from the games. That little lump of red is a mascot? I tend to be a grump when it comes to mascots. When I arrived in Paris and saw the mascot for the Summer Olympics was a lump of red, I was baffled. Was it a pastry? A Pachmann creature? But over these two weeks, Frige named. After the Fergian cap that's a French symbol of freedom and Republican self-government grew on me. The giant Frige's running around at sporting events are absurdly lovable. I like them even more, with their googly eyes, when tourists are wearing them on their heads. I also like that the French went big with the sartorial mascot that is fundamentally uncool. Next time you see me hiking in the mountains, I'll have a red frige on my head. The unforced error of the Olympics undoing the magic of this year's best medal ceremony. This one should have been a wow moment in a good way. The floor exercise final ended with perhaps the most memorable medal ceremony of the whole Olympic Games, in which two U.S. gymnasts, Simone Biles and Jordan Childs, who had won silver and bronze, bowed to Rebecca Andrade of Brazil, who had won gold. But now, it's a complete mess. Childs had earned her bronze after a last-minute score inquiry boosted her score by a tenth of a point, which was enough for her to jump from fifth place to third place over a Romanian gymnast. Romania protested the result, saying Childs' challenge was filed too late. On Saturday, an independent arbitrator agreed, finding the inquiry had been filed four seconds too late. Olympic officials asked Childs to return the medal. In a twist, the U.S. said late Sunday that it had video evidence conclusively establishing the inquiry was submitted in under a minute. It's too soon to know how this will all play out, but this is a disaster and a stain on gymnastic judging and the various arbitration and administration officials involved. Why was there apparently no official timekeeping record? Why weren't the gymnasts' routines scored correctly in the first place? Why not allow the U.S. to submit evidence to the contrary before demanding the medal be returned? And why, oh, why, would the Olympics have asked Childs to return her medal, rather than accepting responsibility for the failure and allowing the gymnasts to share the medals, as Romania asked? The spirited, behind-the-scenes athleticism. The same night, Sydney McLaughlin Levroni successfully defended her gold in the 400-meter hurdles. Shattering her own world record, most of the 80,000 spectators had filtered out of the Stade de France stadium when an after-show began. Volunteers in their teal uniforms began what looked like a choreographed production. To clear the 10 lines of hurdles off of the track in unison. It wasn't all work. They had fun too. Later holding their own impromptu, 100 meter race on the purple track. The thing about Olympic sprinters is that it's easy to take their feats for granted. When the differences between the world's fastest runners are minuscule compared to the general population, the volunteers after show may be the closest I've gotten to witnessing what it might look like to see a normal person compete against an Olympian. Then, during the women's basketball final, keeping the floor swept and slip free was a two-person job. When the game traveled to one end of the court, I watched as one volunteer ran out with a large circle mop to wipe the floor, while the other played their spotter, making sure there was no interference in play. From where I was sitting, it looked like a well-run pick and roll. The Cups The Paris Olympics set out to be the most sustainable games of the modern era. For those who attended the events, perhaps the most visible part of that effort was the ubiquitous red plastic eco-cups that were used to serve beverages at concession stands. Rather than receive a plastic soda bottle, you paid a two deposit and got your soda in a cup, and your euros were refunded if you returned the cups. The cups were a mixed bag environmentally, but I'll remember them for inspiring some truly wacky behavior at these games. You'd see people walking around venues holding stacks of 10 cups or more, I met people attempting to collect all 40-plus variations and others who scrounged in the trash for cups to return to pay for souvenirs. I myself collected more than 10 over the course of the games.
The stack in my hotel room growing shamefully each time I forgot to bring my water bottle to an event. As I returned my last view at the closing ceremony, I bid them a fond farewell. Good night, sweet cups. The roar of the Stade de France. I've covered a lot of sporting events over the years. From NFL and NBA games, World Cup soccer matches, Major League Baseball, and my fair share of collegiate football games. This is my fifth Olympics, and I'm used to how a packed track and field stadium sounds when athletes are doing fantastic things. But I was not prepared for how loud the Stade de France was during the running events. Even sitting right next to a colleague, you'd have to shout for them to hear you. The term deafening is an understatement. It was so loud that the stadium announcer had to the crowd before the start of each race. And once the gun went off, spectators amped up again. It was a treat. Steph Curry making the most of his first Olympic appearance. Before this summer, Steph Curry had achieved almost everything in basketball. Four NBA titles, twice named NBA MVP, two-time gold medalist in the FIBA World Cup. But there was one big item missing from his resume, he'd never been to the Olympics. The thing about Olympic sprinters is that it's easy to take their feats for granted. When the differences between the world's fastest runners are minuscule, compared to the general population, the volunteers after show may be the closest I've gotten to witnessing what it might look like to see a normal person compete against an Olympian. Then, during the women's basketball final, keeping the floor sweat and slip free was a two-person job. When the game traveled to one end of the court, I watched as one volunteer ran out with a large circle mop to wipe the floor, while the other played their spotter, making sure there was no interference in play. From where I was sitting, it looked like a well-run pick and roll. The Cups. The Paris Olympics set out to be the most sustainable games of the modern era. For those who attended the events, perhaps the most visible part of that effort was the ubiquitous red plastic eco-cups that were used to serve beverages at concession stands. Rather than receive a plastic soda bottle, you paid a two deposit and got your soda in a cup and your euros were refunded if you returned the cups. The cups were a mixed bag environmentally, but I'll remember them for inspiring some truly wacky behavior at these games. You'd see people walking around venues holding stacks of 10 cups or more. I met people attempting to collect all 40-plus variations and others who scrounged in the trash for cups to return to pay for souvenirs. I myself collected more than 10 over the course of the games. The stack in my hotel room growing shamefully each time I forgot to bring my water bottle to an event. As I returned my last view at the closing ceremony, I bid them a fond farewell. Good night, sweet cups. The roar of the Stade de France. I've covered a lot of sporting events over the years. From NFL and NBA games, World Cup soccer matches, Major League Baseball, and my fair share of collegiate football games. This is my fifth Olympics, and I'm used to how a packed track and field stadium sounds when athletes are doing fantastic things. But I was not prepared for how loud the Stade de France was during the running events. Even sitting right next to a colleague, you'd have to shout for them to hear you. The term deafening is an understatement. It was so loud that the stadium announcer had to the crowd before the start of each race. And once the gun went off, spectators amped up again. It was a treat. Steph Curry making the most of his first Olympic appearance. Before this summer, Steph Curry had achieved almost everything in basketball. Four NBA titles, twice named NBA MVP, two-time gold medalist in the FIBA World Cup. But there was one big item missing from his resume, he'd never been to the Olympics.